Thanks very much. Um, yeah. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build a little on what, what Chris said and narrow down into some specific areas uh, to do with communication. Before I do that, a word about me. I'm afraid I, I haven't brought a PowerPoint presentation. Apologies. Um, I'm uh, Simon Vitalik. I'm the head of the climate change team at the Institute for Public Policy Research. For those of you who don't know, it is a, a, a progressive think tank um, staff about 70, works across policy areas um, and has been going since 1988. And before that, I was commissioning editor of the Ecologist magazine, co-ran a small grant making foundation on environmental issues. And before that, I was a student here at the LSE, um, greatly enjoying debating politics and the environment and doing other student journalism. So it's good to be back. Um, at IPPR and our, our climate change team, um, we initiated a project on how to stimulate climate-friendly behaviour, <coughs> essentially targeted at government. What did government need to do to um, design the right policies, um, encourage the right techniques and communication campaigns to um, stimulate climate-friendly behaviour amongst the public? Um, that project, has, has, uh, the first half of which has, has just come to an end, and um, I encourage you to look at IPPL's website. Um, our report, Positive Energy, has just been published um, on Monday. Um, it's pretty big, but there's a good executive summary that, that um, if you'll scrap the time, um, is, is worth going through. Um, and as part of that um, project, and actually as part of that report, um, we commissioned a couple of experts in discourse analysis um, and semiotics. For those of you who don't know those, those disciplines, and they're essentially experts in, in the language of, of communications and the imagery um, uh, around it um, and what impact it, ha it has on um, the people that are exposed to it. Um, the reason for doing that is because we, we, of course, wanted to make recommendations on communications. Communications um, plays a role, um, but I should say right now that we don't think, and all the evidence suggests that, of course, and as Chris has said, communications alone is done badly, it's certainly not a panacea. Um, and in fact, the, 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 the recommendations we make um, uh, to the government on this issue are quite clear. They have to put policies in place to make the alternatives we want people to adopt convenient, affordable, attractive, visible, etc. Um, before you start telling them to use it, and as well, uh, as well, make sure that the, all the, the bad things we don't want them to do are expensive and inconvenient, and all the all the other um, uh, negative um, attributes to incentivise change. But in as much as communications can play a role, it's it's very easy to get it wrong, and there are some things that um, that are quite straightforward. Chris has touched on them, and Solly will talk about them as well to get right. Um, even before we got there, we wanted to know. How is climate change already communicated in the UK? What is the backdrop against which any new climate communications campaign or campaigns um, uh, will be set against? And so we asked these experts to, to, to look at 600 articles in the UK, um, newspapers, magazines, some TV and radio news clips and ads, press ads, websites. Um, this was about a year and a half ago. So I think things have changed a bit, but not that significantly. Um, and, and they came up with some very interesting conclusions. Um, the first thing they, came, they, they, they established was it came some, something as a surprise to those of us who engaged in the debate and have been for a long time. We think the debate's over, the science is wrapped up, there's absolutely no question that it's a problem, um, and it's quite obvious what to do about it. We're responsible and there are straightforward actions to take. Actually, it seems. Um, but the discourse around climate change, at least in the UK, is still quite contested. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a significant degree of tension <coughs> in terms of, of the coverage of the issue still, but every aspect of it. Is it, is it human caused? Um, can we do something here as individuals, or is it really down to governments and businesses? Can the UK do anything, or do we just wait for China and the US to do something? All of these, these issues are regular features of, of coverage of the issue in the media. Um, and, and the experts we commissioned concluded this was likely to lead the public to think, my God, who knows? Who knows if we can make a difference? And sure enough, if you look at the polls, um, and, and they're crude, and there they're, they're are big problems with the, the opinion polls on, on any issue, um, but they, they, they give you a very crude idea of the state of public opinion. 
people care about the issue, they think it's serious and they're worried about the implications. But when you ask them whether they think they can make a difference, they're not sure. And that's the problem. The other, the other aspect of, of the research was, was that the, the, the experts, Jill and Nat, um, identified a, a, a clear a set of repertoires, uh, types of, of uh, categories of, of, of discourse around the issue. Um, that, that are equally very well worth knowing about if you're interested in communicating on this issue yourself. They, they identified three groups. Um, one was the alarmism repertoire on its own, fundamentally pessimistic category um, on one side, and two optimistic groups of repertoires. One which concludes that everything will be alright if we just ignore the problem, and the other um, set of repertoires that assume it'll be all right as long as we do something. Um, so quite clear and distinct. The dominant two repertoires are the alarmism repertoire they found and um, a, a specific aspect of the, of the um, pragmatic, optimistic repertoire that assumes everything will be all right if we do something. You'll all be familiar with the alumnism repertoire. You see it regularly on the front page of the Independent newspaper, um, amongst other places. But equally, you know, put our hands up here. I've used it. I'm sure many of you do in the past. Um, it's very easy to. The problem is, is uh, unprecedented in terms of, of, of uh, the scale and the impact. But uh, what we're interested in is understanding the net effect of all this communication. And I should say it's not just communications that were analysed from the media, but from the government too, and NGOs, all the main green groups of communications were analysed as well. And they are as guilty as, as many of us have been, and the government has been, and certainly the media has been, in terms of, of, of the alarmism repertoire. Um, the, the issue is characterised as being huge, awesome, terrible, um, beyond human control, um, and, and across the ideological spectrum, you see it in broadsheets, in tabloids, popular magazines, campaign literature, as I was saying. And it's typified by an inflated or extreme use of language, um, incorporating very urgent tones, actually often cinematic tones as well, and almost religious um, registers of doom and death and heaven and hell, uh, judgment, um, and also at the same time language of acceleration. Um, everything's increasing, it's always getting worse, intractability as well, and irreversibility and momentum. And the problem with that is, it's clearly, it's probably obvious to most of you, that the scale of the problems it's shown in that, in that way, in the end, excludes the possibility of, of real action or agency um, by the reader or viewer who ever exposed to this sort of communications. Because it, it contains an implicit counsel of despair. The problem's just too big for us to take on, so what on earth can we do? Um, and, and at the same time, it's sensationalism and Connection with the unreality of, of movies um, distances people from the issue and uh, positions climate change possibly as another apocalyptic construction that might be a figment of our cultural imagination, which further undermines its ability to provoke people or to stimulate people into taking action. So there's that repertoire to bear in mind. Another set of, 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 of repertoires around this issue that were very interesting, but it's not dominant, whereas alarmism is, but which are there nonetheless. Um, the authors of, of, the, of, the, of the research called Settlerism and British Comic Nihilism. Um, <laughs> these, these, are, these are repertoires that, um, as I was saying a moment ago, assume that everything will be fine if we ignore the problem. Now, they're out there. Um, if particularly in some of the right-wing um, media, um, you know, occasionally the Telegraph, occasionally the Times, um, the Spectator, other, other places too. Settlerdom is named after the, the settler's attitudinal typology that, that, that others have devised to describe people with sustenance-driven needs, people who want the basic foundations of um, a roof over their house, over their heads, uh, food on the table, etc., security-driven. Um, and so the term um, is, is given to this, to this discourse um, because it, it rejects uh, and mocks the alarmist discourse primarily by invoking common sense um, on behalf of the same majority um, in opposition to the doom mongers. Uh, it dismisses climate change as a thing that's so fantastic it can't possibly be true 
and reflect